The bar was a lot louder, a lot smokier, and a lot more crowded as the hour grew late and the people who had already seen the one movie playing in the town drifted into take advantage of the only other entertainment Crystal Lake had to offer. The band was cranking up, feeding off the energy of the crowd, and the lead singer had gotten drunk enough to lay into some Bob Seeger with at least a slight degree of authenticity. Ted's collection of empty beer bottles had grown to about a dozen, and even with his dragster-like metabolism, he was starting to feel seriously buzzed. He had eaten some pizza earlier to cut the booze, but every drink order was just another excuse to talk to the lovely Maggie with her jet black hair, hazel eyes, beautiful long legs, and the blouse that seemed somehow to have come a little more unbuttoned since the last time he had looked at it, which had not been very long ago at all. He wondered if he could possibly be imagining it. He'd been flirting with the girl all evening, trying to get up enough nerve to make a move, and hoping that he wasn't sounding like a nerd, when all the time she'd been flirting right back, and he'd been so preoccupied with trying not to look bad that he'd hardly even noticed. Maggie was starting to get a bit concerned, that he'd never get his act together. She figured that after a few drinks, he'd overcome his shyness and stop with the silly jokes. But he just kept putting them away and acting like an awkward little boy. Not being obnoxious, just silly. Everything she'd done to try to let him know that she was interested had gone right past him. She felt exasperated. She was getting tired of winking at him. She felt as if her eye was twitching. And she had already unbuttoned the top three buttons on her blouse. If she got any more obvious than that, she'd fall right out. She'd wish to hell he'd stop playing around and come right out and ask her if she was doing anything after she got off work, which would be in about another half an hour. She could tell that he was nervous, but for God's sake, how thick could a guy be? She'd been sending him signals all night long, and he still hadn't picked any of them up. Or if he had, he was too uptight to act on them. Still, it was kind of sweet to see a guy who was so obviously not slick. She was really tired of guys who tried to come on cool and macho. Just about every guy in town had tried to put the make on her. And here was this cute boy, sort of sitting there and goofing around with her, almost as if he was shuffling his feet in the dirt and saying, Oh gosh, shucks. She could hardly believe he was for real. She wanted to wrap him up and take him home and eat him. Paul tipped back his beer bottle and chugged what was left of the brew. He set the bottle down inside. I've got to get some sleep, he said, knowing that he'd reached his limit. Ginny gave him a knowing look. I'm tired, she said with an exaggerated yawn. Quitting already? Ted asked, dreading the moment of truth now that it had arrived. He glanced at Maggie, wiping down the bar just a couple of feet away. She smiled at him. There was no more putting it off. Somehow he had to get his courage up and ask her. It had to be now or never. Ted, said Paul, astonished at his capacity. You'd have me out till breakfast if I let you. Ginny stretched, allowing her hand to gently graze Paul's thigh as it came down. I'll ride back with you, okay? She said, hoping that Ted would get the message. Come on, boy, she thought.
The girl obviously likes you, and we're getting the hell out of your way. Get on with it. Paul gave her a look as he felt her fingers trail over his thigh, perilously close to his groin. He started to gather up his money, except for the tip he was leaving on the bar. Maggie came over to take away their bottles and wish them a good night. When the place closes, you come back to camp, got it? said Paul with a big wink at Ted. Yes, boss. Paul glanced pointedly at Maggie. Then he reached into the pocket of Ted's jacket and removed the keys to Jeff's truck. As Ted watched, dumbfounded, he handed the keys to Maggie. And let Maggie drive the pickup, he said, winking at her and handing her the keys. Then he turned and walked away with Ginny on his arm. Ted stared after him, open-mouthed. Then he glanced back at Maggie as she smiled and twirled the truck keys. Ted smiled awkwardly. Excuse me, he said to her. Are there any after-hours places around here? Sure, she said, smiling and holding his gaze as she put the keys away inside her pocket. My place. Ginny gave Paul a nudge as they walked out the front door of the bar. You're so bad, she said. No, I'm not. Ted is, Paul said. I was beginning to think that Maggie would have to rip her blouse open and hold up a sign before he got the message. Ginny giggled. You think he'll be coming back tonight? she asked. I don't think so, said Paul, grinning. Maggie has the keys. He glanced up at the sky. The rain was starting to come down pretty hard. Okay, he said, turning the collar of his jacket up. Let's make a run for it. I'm going, I'm going, said Ginny, hooking her arm through his and running for the parking lot with her jacket up over her head. They made it to the Volkswagen just as the rain started to come down in buckets. They rolled up all the windows and Paul grimaced at the trickle of water that immediately started to come in through the roof just above his head. This thing had better start he said, shoving the key into the ignition. You fixed it, Ginny reminded him. I know, that's what worries me, he said. He turned the key. The starter motor whined in protest several times. There was a frightful clunk, and then the engine coughed, backfired like a bazooka, and caught settling into a chugging idle that sounded like a dying motorcycle running on one cylinder. Paul glanced at Ginny dubiously. She shrugged. With a sigh of resignation, he shifted into first and let out the clutch, half expecting the little car to shudder and expire on the spot. Instead, it leapt out of its parking space as if it had been goosed laying a patch of rubber on the asphalt as it chirped its tires. Nice clutch, thought Paul, as he shifted into second gear, and the VW lurched once more. At this rate, he thought, we might not make it through the night. Vicky was running from her cabin toward the main house when the rain started. She made it up the steps of the front porch, just as the sky seemed to open up. Well, so much for primping, she thought. They were both going to get soaked now. She opened the door and came into the living room, shaking out her hair and looking around. There wasn't anyone in sight. Mark, she said. She frowned and walked through the front room and into the kitchen. There was no sign of him. Mark, she said. Where are you? Returning to the front room, she wondered where he could have disappeared to. Surely he couldn't have gone up the stairs. Not in that wheelchair. She glanced up the darkened stairs. 
not hearing anything, wondering if Sandra and Jeff knew where he was. Unless they'd left or fallen asleep up there. She smiled, judging by the energetic sounds they had made earlier. They were probably both dead by now. Anybody still here? She called hesitantly. Sandra? Jeff? She started up the stairs. Sandra? She said, not really wanting to walk in on them, but worried about Mark. The thunder crashed and lightning briefly illuminated the dark stairwell as she walked softly toward the bedroom door. She knocked twice, waited a moment, and then knocked once more. There was no answer. There were no sounds coming from inside. She turned the knob and opened the door a crack. Sandra? She whispered, peeking inside. The sheets were pulled over, two forms huddled together on the bed. She could see Sandra's hair spilling out over the pillow. Vicky pushed the door open and went inside. She tiptoed over to the bed, thinking perhaps she could just wake Sandra up and not disturb Jeff. She was starting to get really worried about Mark. He was nowhere in the house and it was raining cats and dogs outside. Sandra? She whispered, reaching out to touch the sheet shrouded form. The sheets were suddenly thrown back and Jason Voorhees sat up in the bed where he had been laying next to Sandra's dead, blood-spattered body. Vicky screamed as she beheld those two burning eyes gazing out at her from behind the dirty hood. A knife flashed and she felt as if a red hot wire had been pulled across her skin. She looked down in horror at the blood bubbling up out of the deep slash in her leg, at the raw flesh laid open by the blade. She backed away, limping, in shock, and still not fully feeling the pain. She stumbled against the door and recoiled from the sight of Jeff's nude body impaled on a coat hook in the wall, dark blood coagulating on his stomach. She screamed again as Jason stabbed her in the chest, the blade piercing her skin and skipping off the bone. Jason plunged it in deeply, then withdrew it and slammed it into her again with pile driver force. She stopped screaming as a brilliant white hot light blotted out her sight and she sank down into the darkness. He watched her while the life trickled out of her and for a while a very brief while, the raging fever in him subsided. He was doing what he had to do. He was doing it all for her. Now he had to take them back and show her. He bent down, lifted Vicky by her arms, and dragged her limp corpse across the floor and down the stairs her trailing feet thumping on the steps. He would bring her downstairs first, and then he would get the others, all of them, to show her how well he was carrying out her wishes. He would carry them all out to the cabin in the woods and bring them one a time into the back room, her room, he would take them back to mother. The rain was coming down in sheets as Paul hunched over the steering wheel, squinting through the windshield.
The VW seemed to hit every single pothole in the road, and the suspension was on the verge of quitting altogether. Since the drainage on the dirt roads left a great deal to be desired, the roads were quickly turning into mud. What they really needed in this weather, Paul felt, was a 4x4 like Jeff's, not a rattle trap Volkswagen bug patched together with pop rivets and body putty. Volkswagen hadn't made the damn things since 1979, but there were still about a trillion of them on the road, and all of a sudden they had become in again, especially among the college crowd. Paul had never really given them a fair chance, choosing instead to contrast them with flashier, sportier cars. On the plus side, however, they were cheap, had reasonable traction in the snow, and just about anybody could work on one. This was clearly one of the attractive features for those who were less mechanically inclined. Oh, yes, and they were cute, which was probably the main reason behind their resurgence as fashionable transportation. The trouble was, there were a lot of people out there who were buying up old wrecks, cars that had been banged up or totaled, or that had rusted through, and they were grinding away the rusted pieces, often leaving gaping holes in the bodywork and floor, which they covered up with pieces of sheet metal pop riveted into place. Then they hammered out the dents as best they could, slapped a thick coat of body putty over the whole thing, sanded it, and painted it some bright and cheery color, maybe put some rally stripes on the darn thing, and then they could sell it to some unsuspecting high school or college kid for at least one or two thousand dollars. It was a real rip-off. VW Bugs weren't the only cars they did this with, but because the Bugs were cheap and fairly plentiful, they were the most cost-effective to recondition. In some cases, this reconditioning was actually accomplished by taking one car that had been smashed up so badly in the rear that even the frame had cracked literally sawing it in half and welding it to another half a car that had been totaled from the front. Paul was starting to get an uncomfortable feeling that Ginny's bright red bug might have been one of those. Maybe it was bright and shiny on the outside, but on the inside it was a real old lady as it jounced along on the rutted, muddy road. It felt as if it were about to split in half. On top of that, his shirt was soaked from the steady trickle of water leaking through the roof. Now he knew why Ginny had decided to let him drive, so she could sit where it was dry. He swore under his breath, as the car swerved, sliding in the mud as he turned it into the dirt road leading down to the counselor training center. It bounced over the ruts as if it were a pogo stick and came to a wheezing halt in front of the main house about fifteen feet from the porch. Nice night, said Jitty, with a grimace. Yeah. For a duck, Paul said. He stared out the windshield at the main house, frowning. What the hell are all the lights on for? He said. They ran out of the car and up the porch steps. The front door was wide open, banging in the wind. Paul, said Ginny, shaking her head. They wouldn't leave the place like this. She gave him a worried look. Think something's wrong? Without waiting for an answer, she hurried toward the stairs.
I'll check upstairs. Paul looked around the room. Everything seemed just as they had left it, except for one small thing. He picked up a roach from the ashtray on the table and smelled it. These kids smoke better dope than I do, he said, dropping the roach back in the ashtray. He felt a little easier. They had probably all gotten wasted and crashed, forgetting to turn out the lights. Suddenly, he was jolted out of it by the sound of Ginny's frightened voice calling him from upstairs. Paul! She sounded scared. As she called his name again, he raced up the stairs to the bedroom. Ginny was standing over the bed, an expression of utter dread frozen on her face. She pointed down at the rumpled sheets, pulled back to show a large puddle of blood soaking into the mattress and dripping down onto the floor beneath the bed. More blood was streaked across the floor, and there was some splattered on the wall. Is this some kind of joke? said Paul, thinking that it had to be. The kids were just screwing around, playing a prank on them to get even with that bit he had pulled at the campfire. It had to be red paint that they were looking at, he thought. It simply had to be. It couldn't possibly be what he was afraid it was. They wouldn't do anything like this, said Ginny, shaking her head. Her voice trembled slightly as she clutched at his arm. As if on cue, a brilliant bolt of lightning illuminated the entire room, lighting up their faces and a moment later they heard the deafening clap of thunder that shook the rafters of the house. The lights flickered and went out. Ginny, come on, said Paul, heading back downstairs. Wait for me, she said, hurrying after him, unwilling to be left alone even for one second. She didn't know what the hell was going on, but she had a terrible suspicion that this was not a joke. Whatever it was, it was really happening. It wasn't like sitting in a movie and getting caught up in the story, knowing you'd be safe when the credits rolled and the lights came back on. There was no way out of this. She was actually trapped and this horrifying plot. Paul reached into his pocket and pulled out a small pen light. He snapped it on as they went down the stairs. Trust my boy scout to always be prepared, thought Jenny. She used to tease him about all the things he carried in his pockets, like a six-year-old boy bearing all his treasures with him all the time. The red Victorinox Swiss army knife, which he was never without. The spark plug gapper on his keychain. The watch that told both ordinary and military time, as well as giving the day and date and monitoring his pulse rate. The compass. The tiny pen light. Well, she had to hand it to him. When you needed something like that, you really needed it, and Paul was ready. The beam of the tiny light was barely enough to see by, but it sure as hell beat not having any lights at all. They went downstairs, and Paul glanced into the kitchen. Lights are out there, too, he said. Must be the main fuse again. Paul? What's going on? She said. She was really scared now. This wasn't funny. Nobody was around. It's nothing, Paul said, trying hard to sound as if he really believed that. Where is everybody? She said. He rummaged through the kitchen drawers, looking for a spare box of fuses. 
cursing himself for not having spent the extra money to go with circuit breakers. Of course, now that he needed them, there were no extra fuses to be found. I don't know, he said, answering her question perhaps a bit too brusquely. He didn't know what the hell was going on either and it was really getting on his nerves. If this was some sort of sick joke on the part of the others, they were sure as hell going to be awful goddamned sorry in the morning. He slammed the drawer shut, disgusted at not being able to find any spare fuses. Now they were stuck in the dark, and it was his own damn fault. He should have double-checked the supply list more carefully. Well, enough was enough. The joke had worn real thin. He figured the other kids were all hiding in one of the other cabins, laughing their asses off. They'd be laughing out of their sides of their faces by the time he got through with them. He glanced out through the kitchen window. Rain stopping. We'll go look for them, he said, grimly. He flashed the beam around, scowling that it was so weak. He'd have to make a point of picking up a more powerful pocket light at some point. He stopped, taking a deep breath as Ginny knocked right into him. He counted ten, telling himself it's all right. Don't get bent out of shape about it. The lights are out, and everyone seems to have disappeared. She's scared. Hell, you're a little scared yourself. Don't go snapping at her. That really isn't what we need right now. Paul, she said, suddenly, her voice full of hysteria her fingernails digging into his upper arm, hard enough to draw blood. There's someone in this room. Oh, for God's sake, he thought, as he swept the beam of his penlight around the room, seeing absolutely nothing. That's all I need, Ginny, he thought. Will you please not lose it on me, just cause the goddamn lights went out? And then he saw a shadow dart across the room. He heard the heavy, labored breathing. It was absolutely unmistakable. There was someone in the room with them. Paul, there's someone in this fucking room! Ginny screamed. Paul swung the light around just as Jason charged him. He briefly saw the image of a large, shadowy, hooded figure bearing down upon him. Something long and sharp and pointed held before it. He sidestepped the savage lunge just in time. He felt the spear graze his side and become embedded in the wall behind him, splintering from the sheer power of the muscular arms that drove it at him, missing him by a hair. He heard the wooden shaft break with a sharp snap as it struck the wall behind him. He felt the heavy body brush past him, heard the deep animalistic breathing, smelled the stench of blood mixed with powerful, acrid body odor. The penlight sailed away across the room as Paul grappled with the figure, feeling the incredible power in those massive arms that encircled him in a crushing bear hug, forcing him down onto the floor. He felt the hot, heavy, stinking breath against his face as the hooded figure came up against him forcing him to the floor, seeking to squeeze the very life out of him. Arms flailed. There was the sound of groans and grunts as they rolled across the floor, each trying to gain the upper hand. 
Paul, feeling the clearly superior strength of the creature he was fighting, yet drawing upon all the reserves of his willpower, intent upon battering the crazed beast he was fighting into submission, determined not to lose. Ginny backed away against a wall, stifling a scream that threatened to break loose from her throat and never stop. She felt utterly helpless as she watched the two shadowy figures pound each other with a fierce, relentless savagery. She watched them as they rolled across the floor, crashing into furniture, overturning chairs and tables. She could hear the dull sounds of fists slamming into flesh. And then, suddenly, there was only silence. It was a silence more terrifying than any sound she had ever heard before. The sound of a brutal struggle of life and death suddenly gave way to utter quiet, a quiet that made her blood run cold. She stood, pressed up against the wall, holding her breath, her mouth completely dry. She was afraid to make the slightest sound, terrified of uttering the faintest whisper. Yet, at the same time, it was as if a fist had plunged into her stomach to find her inner self and squeeze with a relentless fury. She had to know. The adrenaline coursed through her veins, pounding through her blood vessels like a freight train running out of control. Her eyes were riveted upon the spot where she had last seen the shadowy shapes tumbling over each other, locked in a life-or-death struggle for survival. Paul? she whispered hoarsely. She saw the silhouette of a figure rising up off the floor, and she held her breath as she squinted into the darkness. Paul, is that you? Please, she thought fervently. Oh, please, oh God, Paul, let it be you. Paul? The shadowy figure stumbled toward her. She could hear the deep gasps of breath, as if a drowning person were trying to gulp air into his lungs. Paul? She backed up until she felt the wall behind her. Answer me, she shouted. The hooded figure of Jason Voorhees suddenly loomed before her. She saw the blazing eyes staring at her hatefully through the eye holes cut into the hood he wore over his head. She saw the bloody hand reaching out for her. She screamed and ran, plunging through the door and running down the narrow corridor into the bathroom, slamming the door behind her and locking it holding her hand on the knob, resting the weight of her body against the door. She tried to catch her breath. She tried to think. She had to get out of there somehow. She had to escape. He would be there in a moment. The bathroom window. Holding her breath, she edged away from the door, half expecting to see him come crashing through it at any moment. When she reached for the bathroom window to open it, the window erupted inward in a spray of shattered glass as Jason smashed through it from the outside. His arm reached and tried to grab her. Ginny screamed and bolted through the bathroom door, running back down the hall into the kitchen. She slammed the door shut behind her and crouched against it, bringing her fist up to her mouth and biting down upon it in an effort to choke off the screams that threatened to erupt from her throat. She pressed her ear against the door, listening 
there was no sound of pursuing footsteps. Trying to control the furious pounding of her heart, Ginny got to her feet, her eyes darting all around her, desperately seeking a weapon with which to protect herself. She spotted the rack of carving knives mounted on the wall. She grabbed the biggest one and held it tightly in her hand, her eyes staring wildly at the door. She saw the doorknob turn slowly, and then the entire door shook as he tried to force the lock. The door stopped shaking, and for a moment it seemed as if he had given up. And then the door splintered as the pointed black tines of an iron pitchfork were driven through it. Ginny screamed and ran across the room, seeking an escape. She pulled open the first door that she came to, but it was a closet, and she screamed hysterically as the stiff, blood-spattered body of Crazy Ralph came tumbling out, its dead weight dropping directly on top of her. She recoiled from the corpse in horror, pushing it away frantically. The kitchen door was being methodically hacked to pieces by repeated blows from the heavy pitchfork. She climbed up onto the sink and struggled to raise the window over it. It was stuck. With an effort born of sheer desperation, she forced the window up, then tumbled through it onto the muddy ground below. She rolled as she hit the ground and came up running, dashing directly toward her VW bug. She threw open the door and jumped into the driver's seat, slapping the door locks down and pawing madly through her pockets for the key. She found it and thrust it into the ignition switch. The starter made stubborn grinding sounds as she turned the key and pumped the accelerator. The engine would not turn over. She tried again, with no result. The starter motor kept whining uncooperatively. Oh, come on, come on, come on, she pleaded, all to no avail. Suddenly, Jason's hooded head popped up into view, inches away from the side window. She screamed and scrambled away from the fearsome apparition, but when she looked again, he was gone. For a moment she sat motionless, holding her breath, and then she screamed once more as the black tines of the pitchfork ripped through the convertible roof, cutting a huge gash in it. Oh my God! she cried, as Jason's arm reached in, groping for her. She unlocked the door and kicked it open with all her might. The door struck Jason and knocked him off his feet. As he fell, Ginny burst out of the car on the opposite side and ran for all she was worth. She ran up the hill toward the other cabins. Then she paused as she reached a thick stand of bushes. She could hear him running after her, his heavy footsteps squelching in the mud behind her. She hid behind the bushes, biting her lip and waiting. As he came around, she lunged out suddenly and drove her foot into his groin with all her might. He crumpled to the ground as she ran back toward the cabins, heading for Vicky's yellow car. She tried the doors. They were locked. When she heard him coming, she ducked in front of the car, huddling close to its front grill as he came around behind it with the pitchfork in his hand. She waited until he had moved on. Then she took off at a dead run, sobbing for breath as she headed for her cabin. She had to get out of this somehow. She had to. She couldn't let it all 
end here. Suddenly, he came crashing through the underbrush at the sides of the trail, lunging at her. She barely twisted away from him with a terrified cry and continued running up the path. She plunged through the door of her cabin, not really knowing where she was going, but merely fleeing from his relentless pursuit. As she heard his heavy footsteps coming up the path, she scrambled underneath her bed, curling herself up into a tiny ball and holding her breath as the door swung open with a squeak and he came into the cabin. When she saw his heavy, black, mud-encrusted boots approach the bed and pause, she bit her lower lip, afraid to make the slightest sound. The floorboard creaked as he moved closer, seeking her. She saw him go over to the storage closet and fling the door open, looking for her. Then he flung a chair away from him with frustration. Suddenly, she sensed another presence underneath the bed with her and bit her tongue to keep from screaming as a huge rat scuttled past her face. She cringed as the rodent stopped within inches of her, its whiskers twitching, its feral mouth working, its nose sniffing at her. In utter horror and revulsion, Ginny drew her knees up beneath her and choked back a moan as her bladder released a hot stream of urine. Jason paused on his way back out the door, noticing the trickle of liquid coming from underneath the bed. Ginny peered out from her hiding place. There was no sign of Jason's heavy boots. Could he have left? Slowly, tentatively, she ventured out, looking all around her. She heard a creak and glanced up to see Jason standing above her on a chair, his pitchfork poised to strike. Her eyes went wide and she screamed, recoiling instinctively, saved only by the flimsy wooden chair breaking under Jason's weight at the last moment. It collapsed beneath him, sending him crashing to the floor. The pitchfork splintered and broke in half as he fell. Suddenly, remembering what she had hidden in the storage closet of her cabin, Ginny threw the door open and reached for the chainsaw that she had left there earlier. She flicked on the switch and gave the starter cord a furious yank, almost crying when the chainsaw started on the first pull. She brought it around just barely in time as Jason lunged at her. The whirling blades missed his hooded face by inches and he recoiled, retreating before the swiftly whirring teeth as Ginny came at him, brandishing her weapon. He threw up his arm to protect himself and the saw bit into it, chewing through the flesh and biting into bone where it got stuck and caused the motor to stall as Jason struck out with his other arm to knock the saw away. He doubled over and covered himself up. Ginny picked up a wooden chair and brought it down on him with all her might. Jason fell and lay still as it broke over his head. She turned and ran only wanting to put as much distance between herself and the psychopathic killer as possible. She had never been so scared in her entire life. My God, she thought. It was all true. The legend had been real all along. He must have been living out here in the woods all these years, like the story claimed. And when Paul came back here to open up his training center, that was what had set him off. Paul, 
She clutched at her stomach as she staggered down the trail toward the woods. Oh, God, she thought. Paul, he's dead. They must all be dead. She must be the only one who had made it out alive. And then she suddenly remembered. Ted, if he had clicked with Maggie and gone to spend the night with her, then he would probably be all right. But if he came back to the training center late, there was a good chance that he could run right into Jason. He might be coming back, even at this very moment. Her car was dead. There was no way to go except on foot. She decided to cut through the woods and head for the country road leading into town. If Ted was coming back, she'd recognize Jeff's pickup and try to head him off. Otherwise, she'd go straight to the police and tell them what had happened. She stumbled down the forest trail, gasping for breath, trying to will her pounding heart to slow down. She reached a small stream and sat down on the bank for a moment, trying to catch her breath. Her head was swimming. She was having trouble thinking clearly, which was not unusual under the circumstances. She was in a daze, half in shock from her terrifying experience. Think, she told herself, digging her fingernails into her palms, trying to use the pain to snap herself out of her shock. Get yourself together. Figure out where you are. As near as she could remember, the country road leading into town was in a northerly direction, which meant she had to cross the stream and keep going straight until she hit it. She splashed across the stream and pushed through a break in the thicket on the other side. She came through into a small clearing with the dark silhouette of a wooden cabin about 50 feet away on the other side. She could see a candle burning in the window. Without realizing where she was, she ran toward the cabin, thinking that whoever was inside could help her. Help me, she cried. Please, help me. She burst into the cabin. The place was incredibly filthy, and the smell that assaulted her was horrifying. It was a smell unlike anything she'd ever encountered before. She gagged, holding her mouth against the unbelievable stench. Who could possibly live in such a place? The roof was falling in. The glass in the windows was cracked and broken. The pantry doors had all fallen off their hinges. Garbage was strewn all over the place, and the smell of feces was overpowering. The moist, pungent odor of rot permeated the room, and yet there was another smell, even more horrendous, a sickly, sour, sweet smell that was enough to bring tears to her eyes. The odor of decomposition and decay. With a sinking feeling, she suddenly realized where she was. She was standing in the ruins of one of the old cabins of Camp Crystal Lake. She had found Camp Blood. This had to be the place where Jason had taken refuge, the place where he'd been hiding all these years. Her worst suspicions were confirmed when she glanced out through the broken window and saw the hooded figure of Jason Voorhees come running down the trail, following her like a relentless juggernaut. She cried out and slammed the door shut, bolting it. There was no escape. She ran for the back room as she heard the weight of his body slam against the front door, making it shudder 
on its ancient hinges. She knew it would not keep him out for long. She burst into the back room and slammed the door shut behind her, jamming the bolt in place. And then she suddenly became aware of a flickering light behind her and the overpowering smell. She turned around. Her jaw dropped and her eyes went wide with horror. She shoved her fist into her mouth to shut off the screams that started to spill out of her, and she bit down on her knuckles, hard enough to draw blood. In the center of the room was a crudely constructed wooden altar made from a table covered with a filthy canvas drop cloth. Insects scurried across the canvas, crawling over the surface of the table, surrounded by flickering candles like votive offerings in a church was the rotting, worm-eaten, decapitated head of Pamela Voorhees, and laid out on the table in front of the grisly head was a filthy, moth-eaten sweater, a dirty old pair of dark, woolen trousers, an eight-inch hunting knife in a soiled leather sheath, and a blood-caked machete. Piled on the floor, all around the altar, were the blood-soaked bodies of the slain counselors, as well as the corpse of Deputy Sheriff Winslow, and the long-decayed remains of Alice who had been the lone survivor of the massacre at Camp Crystal Lake. Jason had taken his vengeance upon them all. He had brought them home to mother. Ginny heard the outside door splinter and give way. Then she heard the heavy tread of boots outside the door to the back room. There was nowhere left to run. She looked all around her desperately, but it was hopeless. There was no escape. Clenching her fists and hyperventilating, trying to keep from completely succumbing to hysterics, Ginny tried to force herself to ignore the horror that confronted her, to think of some way out of this terrifying predicament. She could not accept that her death was inevitable. She could not give up. There had to be something she could do. The door to the back room shuddered as something hard struck it with a powerful blow, and Ginny recoiled as the tip of a pickaxe came crashing through the wood. Oh, no, no, no! She whimpered as the axe head was worked back and forth, freed from the wood and drawn back to smash into the door again. She sank down to her knees, fighting back the tears, struggling to keep the screams bottled up because she knew that the moment she gave way to panic, it would all be over. The pickaxe crashed into the door again, splintering it still further. In a moment, he'd be through, and he would tear her to pieces for profaning the shrine he had consecrated with blood to his mother. She glanced at the hideous decomposing head of Pamela Voorhees, and a desperate idea came to her. As Jason pounded at the door with the pickaxe, breaking his way through, Ginny reached out to the altar and picked up the stinking, filthy sweater. Overcoming her revulsion, she quickly pulled it on over her head, trying not to think about the insects crawling all over the table where it had lain. Then she crouched down, kneeling in front of the rotting head of Jason's mother.
trying not to gag on the stench of decomposing flesh as she tucked her hair down underneath the sweater, arranging it in a rough approximation of the tattered wisps of hair upon the grisly head. She almost fainted when a huge, blood-engorged worm slithered out of the head's open mouth, but she managed to fight down the panic as she smeared dirt upon her features and prayed the ruse would work. It was a wild gamble, a desperate, last-ditch attempt to survive, but she had no other options. She would assume the role of Jason's mother and pray that with her college psychology she could manipulate him into buying it. It was her only chance. She reached for the machete lying on the table. The door burst in as Jason broke through, shouldering the debris aside and holding the pickaxe aloft, ready to strike. He saw her and hesitated for a moment, a look of confusion in his eyes. Jason, Ginny said quickly, leaning toward him slightly. It's done, Jason. You've done your job well, and Mommy is pleased. He started to lower the pickaxe. That's a good boy, Ginny said soothingly. Come to Mommy. She held the machete out of sight behind her back. She tried to keep her voice from trembling as she spoke. Come on, she said as he took one shuffling step toward her, cocking his head uncertainly. Come on, Mommy has a reward for you. He stopped, looking doubtful, and started to lift the axe once more. Ginny swallowed hard, trying to keep her nerves steady. Jason, Mother is talking to you, she said raising her voice as if she were chiding a misbehaving boy. He paused, hesitantly lowering the axe once more. Come on, she said. That's my boy. Kneel down. Mother has something for you. He started to go down to his knees. That's it. Kneel down, she said watching him intently as he knelt before her, the axe held loosely before him. That's right, she said, slowly lifting the machete with both hands. Kneel down. But as she twisted slightly, raising the machete, Jason caught a glimpse of his mother's head behind her, and his eyes blazed up at her with fury as she brought the machete down in a fast swing. But it wasn't fast enough. He parried it with the axe head, and the shock of the impact caused her to let go. The machete clattered to the floor. He swung the pickaxe, and Ginny cried out with agony as the blade caught her in the leg, making a deep gash. Ginny! Paul shouted, bursting into the room. Bruised and bleeding, he threw himself at Jason, and the two of them staggered around the room, their arms locked around each other, knocking into the walls as each tried to break the other's grip. They slammed hard into the wreckage of the door, and the impact transmitted up the wall caused several rotting ceiling beams to give way and fall down on top of them. Ginny scrambled for the machete as Jason forced Paul down onto the floor, pinning him with his knees. He retrieved the pickaxe and raised it high over his head so he could murder Paul. But at that precise moment, Ginny lunged at him, bringing the machete down with all her might. 
She swung it like a butcher's maul, putting everything she had into the stroke. The blade whistled through the air and buried itself deep in Jason's shoulder, chopping through the trapezius muscle and the collarbone, almost separating his entire left arm and shoulder from his body. He did not utter a sound. He stiffened and then fell over to his side, sprawling on the floor with the machete embedded deeply in his upper body. He lay utterly still. Ginny stood transfixed, staring down at him. Paul got up beside her. For the first time, he took in the terrifying significance of the back room, the altar with its candles, the rotting severed head of Mrs. Voorhees, the bodies of the slain counselors. He shook his head slowly, horrified at what he saw, not wanting to believe it. Ginny slowly bent down, reaching for the hood over Jason's head. She bit her lower lip and grasped the hood, then slowly pulled it off, revealing Jason's face. They both stared with horror and revulsion at the grotesque features of the monster who had stalked Camp Blood. A boy who had drowned and somehow came back from the dead to take revenge on all those who had wronged him and his mother. Jesus, Paul said in a shocked whisper. Ginny grasped his arm convulsively and shuddered. He took her by the shoulders and turned her away from the horrid sight. Let's go, Ginny, he said, supporting her with her arm across his shoulders. Paul helped her out of the cabin and back down the trail to the training center. She winced from the pain in her gashed leg as the sensation finally penetrated after the shock. She managed to stumble down to the stream with his help, but then she finally collapsed, unable to continue. The pain was just too much to take. She was biting her lip to keep from crying out. Paul could tell she was in agony. He knelt beside her to examine the wound. It looked pretty bad. They would have to do something about it soon, before it became infected. Come on, I'll carry you, he said, picking her up in his arms. He managed to get her back to her cabin, where he lowered her gently to the bed. He was exhausted, and she was near the end of her rope. Her eyes were squeezed tightly shut as she winced from the pain when he put her on the bed. He touched her face, and she threw her arms around him, sobbing as the full impact of her experience finally registered. Hey, you're all right, he said, holding her and kissing her, trying to calm her down. It's over. You're okay, Jenny. You're all right. He hugged her close, stroking her hair to reassure her. Suddenly, there was a noise outside. He felt Ginny stiffen in his arms as she stared, terror-stricken, at the door. Paul glanced at the door, then looked at Ginny, sitting there, frozen with fear. She had gone almost completely white. He looked around for something to use as a weapon, and his gaze fell on the splintered pitchfork Jason had left behind. Paul picked it up and gave the part with the sharp tines to Ginny, taking the shorter part with the iron handle for himself. He held it in his left hand as a club, hefting it experimentally. It would just have to do 
Ginny took the busted pitchfork and braced it against the bed, holding it out before her like a spear. Paul glanced at her, and she nodded. Whatever happened now, they were as ready for it as they could be, and at least they were together. He tiptoed over to the door and stood beside it, listening intently. He seemed to hear a soft scratching sound. He swallowed hard, reached out for the doorknob, took hold of it, and raised the pitchfork handle high over his head. He twisted the knob and flung the door open, and Terry's little dog, Muffin, mud spattered and completely soaked, trotted into the room. The ribbons in her fur were like wet noodles, and she was filthy from being out in the storm. She jumped up into Paul's arms, her tongue lolling and her tail wagging happily. Muffin, Paul said, picking her up. Ginny put down the pitchfork as relief flooded through her. Muffin, oh Muffin, you're okay, she said. She reached out for the little dog, and suddenly the window behind her shattered into a thousand knife-edged fragments as Jason came crashing through it. Ginny had a brief glimpse of the stunned, disbelieving expression on Paul's face, and then she felt Jason's powerful arms encircle her. She saw his horribly ugly face, tufts of wispy hair matted against his mostly bald and puckered scalp, jutting, discolored, rotting teeth, his hideously deformed features, and the awful smell of him like a corpse rising from the grave. And then her vision blurred and everything went black as she fainted from stark terror. She regained consciousness tied down to a stretcher gurney as two attendants wheeled her towards an ambulance. It was daylight. She looked around, dazed, astonished to discover that she was still alive. There were flashing lights all around her, and she could hear the crackle of a police radio. And then she remembered with shocking clarity what had happened before she had passed out, and she cried out, Paul! Where's Paul? No one answered her. She struggled against the restraining straps as they loaded her into the ambulance without saying a word. She kept crying out for Paul as they shut the doors behind her and the ambulance pulled away, heading off down the dirt road back toward town and the county hospital. The sheriff stood by his police cruiser parked outside the cabin his hands thrust into the pockets of his black leather jacket and his hat pulled low over his eyes as he watched the ambulance drive off. They had found the others, but so far they had not found Holt. There was no sign of him except some blood upon the floor in there. He sighed heavily, now the shit would really hit the fan, he thought. He'd have to call the poor parents of those murdered kids. The press would descend upon the town like vultures, and they'd resurrect the story of Camp Blood. Everyone would want to know how the maniac had been able to live out there on the grounds of the old camp without anyone spotting him and why he hadn't been arrested. It would all have to fall on someone, and as sheriff, he would be elected. Everyone would wind up screaming for his hide. He walked around to the back of the cabin and looked down at the large footprints in the mud. Bastard, he thought. He looked up 
and gazed off into the woods, thinking that you could put together the biggest dragnet in three counties and comb these woods for months and never find him. He exhaled heavily. Damn, he thought. Another week, and I'd have been packed and heading for Wyoming. Now he could kiss the Wyoming job goodbye. It looked like he was stuck in Crystal Lake. He shook his head with resignation. Well, at least it was a friendly little town. Too bad there was no way out.